Well, my name is Cheryl Rowland, and it is my absolute joy and privilege to join you in this journey of grace. And um, I know that each of you have important things to share too. So the first part of our time together, I'd like to share some uh, uh, a, a devotional and scripture, then some needs of women and children that we can meet or that are uh, desperate, and then some solutions. And I'd like to hear from you too, your I experiences and your input and the things that you uh, feel God is leading you to do. I have four uh, workshops. One is an introduction of our Women's Ministries Director, Kaylin Vogelman. And for you ladies, there is uh, an SDMI, the structure of SDMI. She is over USA and Canada Women's Ministries. And she's given us her email address if you'd like to contact her with questions or any uh, information, she's there. There is a representative from each uh, educational region on her committee, and I am the SNU representative. And I failed to put my contact information on there. So if you need, um, to, if you need to, to contact me about your women's ministries, uh, ideas, exchange, um, suggestions, or in, in any way that I can help you, I'd be so happy to. There's my card here. Then I have um, printed off a copy of 16 Laws of Mentoring. And I'm sorry I ran, ran short, but Carla's gone to make more copies and she'll be back. I'd like for every one of you to have a copy of these. The, it's a secular, for, uh, from a secular source, but if you are discipling, you've got to have some agreements and some boundaries established, or there will be people who will um, consume you and take advantage of your time together. So it's important as we, um, uh, minister and disciple others that we understand and they understand these are the boundaries for our mentoring relationship and there's Carla thank you everybody said hi Carla <laughs> this is Carla Dodson and she's ran to make more copies so of the oh thank you all right so don't leave home without it okay um, then I have another worksheet Carla has prayed for me and you and for our weekend together that God would be glorified and that we would uh, come to know him better and serve him more effectively. Um, then I have a worksheet that it, this is the, the key to our sessions today. These are just ideas or solutions of things the church can do to reach the homeless and uh, poverty stricken. And I'd like for every one of you to have these and just Hold on to it just until we get to this uh, to the, that section, that part of our workshop. And Carla's going to bring you that, and then she's going to bring you. And I don't know what I do without Carla, yeah. but uh, everybody gets a shoe. Everybody gets a shoe. And do you know you know that song? These boots were made for walking, and that's just what they'll do. Do you know that song? One of these days, these boots are going to walk all over you. And we're talking about the devil because there's a promise, a beautiful promise in Romans 16, 20, and it is the God of peace shall soon crush Satan under your feet. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. If you don't have anything else to leave with, anything else from this workshop, this promise, this uh, combat, uh, this combat promise from God's word will be effective and help you to just, if you just speak this verse to someone who's discouraged, it, it increases your faith, doesn't it? So this is a war, and these are combat boots that have been victorious. And there are testimonies of women and men and children all over the world that have been um, touched by the blood of Jesus. We heard a beautiful example of that through Scott Rainey. What a story, what a, an amazing, remarkable story. So we just praise God for his great faithfulness. Now, I, um, I was as I was preparing for this, I'd like to also um, re uh, introduce my husband, David. And um, he, he said to me, um, you know, faith has feet. The first step before we walk is do we believe? Do we have faith in God that he is the God of all flesh and there isn't anything too hard for him? Do we b believe it? And then we, we move into action, don't we? You might ask why I chose this topic as the Lord le leads. 
David and I um, have been, we pastored on the, dis the Dallas district. David pastored for, uh, on the Dallas district for nearly um, 20 years. Then we shifted to the North Arkansas district where he was a district superintendent. And it was in Arkansas that our 16 year old Cassie fell madly in love with an abusive young man. 16, 17, 18. We've had a test before us and she gave me permission to share a little bit right there and she said, be sure you tell them the happy ending. She's happily married and uh, God delivered her from that relationship. But oh, the journey we had to take to get to her victory. And I praise God. As we dealt with her, uh, I took her one day, I made an appointment with the Crisis Shelter for Abused Women. And it was there that my eyes were open to the devastation of domestic violence and how um, women and children and men, the, it's reversed too, some women are abu the abusers, that uh, there is a place for God to work in tremendous ways. But my eyes were open there and my heart was warmly, warmly um, tuned to God's voice. Uh, from there, we moved to Northeast uh, Indiana and God ordered my steps to the crisis shelter for homeless women. We had uh, it was a Grant County crisis shelter for ho homeless women. It was there that I taught Bible study and they taught me grace. It was there that I taught Bible study and they taught me grace. I will never forget and I will glean from some of their experiences in our time together. Then not, but just a little over a year ago, almost two, David uh, retired and we've moved to Owasa, Oklahoma, where um, he serves as a chaplain for Marketplace Ministries, which is an amazing um, uh, ministry um, that he'll have to share with you uh, sometime. But, uh, and I am working with Dividing Bread Ministry, which is um, community outreach, thrift shop, and uh, food distribution center. So the Lord has continued to intersect our lives with people who are homeless and in poverty. I was alarmed to, to discover that Oklahoma is the fourth most food insecure <coughs> state in the nation. We're number four that one in every four children goes to school hungry, and that 25 of all Oklahoma residents receive food stamps. And by the way, food stamp is $4.02 a day per, per person, not, not enough to feed a family. The public school data reported an estimate, an estimate of 23,372 Oklahoma children experienced homelessness 23,372 children experienced homelessness over the course of the year 2018 to 2019. That is a mind-boggling number. Uh, uh, homelessness, what is it? Homelessness is defined as a lack of a regular residence, a fixed residence. So that means if you're moving from uh, uh, location to location, you're homeless. If you live in an emergency health shelter, you're homeless. If you're living in places not meant for human habitation, like under the bridge in Tulsa, you're homeless. If there are multiple families living together in a substandard dwelling, you're homeless. If you're staying with friends, if you live in a hotel, motel, vehicle, or abandoned house, you're homeless. And it's possible that you, like I, have family members who are homeless, living in poverty, not knowing from one day to the next where their next meal is gonna come from. So we wanna uh, save time to hear your experiences and some things that you and your, your church are doing. We know that as iron sharpens iron, Proverbs tells us, so one person, so one friend sharpens another and that the steps of the righteous person are ordered by God and he's ordered our steps to this room, the purple room, on this day, August 27th, to hear his voice. And I thank you. Let's pray. Oh, Lord God, I thank you and praise you for this room, for this place, for your love that endures forever. We thank you for your journey, the journey of grace, provenient, saving, and sanctifying grace, and for the miracles of Scott Ramey's life. We praise you, Father, for the miracles of our lives, 
And but by the grace of God, we would be homeless or hungry or in need desperately looking for someone to help us. We ask you, Lord, that you would tune our hearts to sing your praise and give us undivided hearts that we may fear your holy name. And oh God, oh sovereign Lord, I pray that you would give me an instructed tongue to know the word that sustains the weary and that you would awaken us morning by morning as those being taught. Oh, how we love you, Lord, and we thank you for loving us. In Jesus, we pray. Amen. Now, I don't want to make anyone feel uncomfortable, but we're all adults here. It was out of pure exasperation that our daughter, Cassie, called me one day to vent. And she said, Mom, you know girls have periods? Well, boys have commas. And my Ryan has been on his comma way too long. <laughs> we get it, don't we? We kind of go through cycles, don't we? That is period, comma, exclamation point. And we think that you guys don't want to uh, highlight, but I got a good one over here. And there's another one sitting right next to him. <laughs> easy, easy. <laughs> men, you men can't uh, really possibly understand the issues that surround a woman's monthly cycle. However, however, three men, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, all recorded Jesus' marvelous, miraculous healing of the woman with the issue of blood. I'm going to read that from the Luke account, and I'd like for you to, with our, our workshop topic in mind, to listen carefully. Now, there was a woman who had been suffering from hemorrhages for 12 years, and though she spent all she had on physicians, she only grew worse. When she heard about Jesus, she came up from behind him, and in a crowd, she touched the fringe of his robe, and immediately, immediately, the bleeding stopped. Then Jesus said, who touched me? When all denied it, Peter said, oh, master, the crowds surround you and press in on you. But Jesus said, no, someone touched me, for I noticed that power has gone from me. When the woman realized that she could not remain hidden. She came trembling and falling down before him, she declared for all the people to hear why she had touched him and how she had been immediately healed. Jesus' response to her was, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. And I want you to pull out your shoe and all of us together are gonna repeat this verse together. The God of peace shall soon crush Satan under your feet. The Lord of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Romans 16, 20. The God of peace crush Satan under her feet. According to the Levitical law, and we've all heard messages about this, but according to the Levitical law, a, a bl flow of blood made a person ceremonially unclean. So as long as this woman had to discharge her clothing, her bed, her furniture, and anyone who touched her was considered unclean. And they were sent into a, a, a colossal inconvenience because they had to wash all their clothes and take a bath and remain isolated until night. So in, a, in, a, in essence, this woman was quarantined for 12 years. Quarantined for 12 years. She has spent every dime she had on doctors and medical treatments only to be let down again and again. And it, the scripture says she even got worse. So she was possibly, she was definitely isolated, <coughs> lonely, <coughs> homeless, helpless, and hopeless. But um, it was the crowd, the church crowd, that gave her a glimmer of hope. I, I read about one um, homeless woman that said she was spit on, pottied on, cussed, and kicked. And it's uh, not beyond our imagination that this woman may have been spit on, pottied on, cussed, and kicked because she was unclean. But in her bold desperation, she reached out to Jesus. It was the church. It was the testimony of believers. And it was the followers of Jesus Christ that gave her a glimmer of hope. Do you know that uh, there's a little verse in Revelation 12, 11 that says, we overcome by the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony. We must share the good news. Now we don't know this woman's name, but Jesus called her daughter 
and she declared his glory. Now, uh, homeless shelters are full of a multitude of women with issues. Most are bleeding on the inside, <coughs> broke, broken, sick, and abused. And you might say, well, there are lots of government uh, uh, programs that are designed to help the needy. And uh, anyway, how do we know who's needy and how do we know they're going to spend our money on their needs? But we know that also that God called the church to care. God called us to care. Now, have any of you heard that country western song called Here's Your Sign? <laughs> Here's Your Sign. Anybody know about that? If you, do, if you don't look it up, it's <laughs> hilarious, honestly. But there are skeptics, aren't they? And there may be reasons why we're skeptical. When you see a panhandler on the side of the street, what do you do? Here are a couple of signs. This guy, he thought you might be more generous if you saw that he has a homeless dog. <laughs> And I did learn that John 3.16, which is an incredible resource, does not allow uh, pets. So that is, a, that is a, a barrier right there to some people receiving help. Okay, here's another one. This lady said, need to buy a vow. Anything will help. God bless. Need to buy a vow. That is a quiz show. I wonder, could I buy a vow? Do you know that? Uh, she, she thought she might make a little money by being humorous. Uh, this guy believes that uh, he has this little contest going, and he says, who's more generous, Buddhists, pagan, agnostic, spiritans, Islam, Christians, who is it that's most generous? And so he has a little bowl for each, each, each uh, faith. And look, agnostic's winning at this point. Interesting, isn't it? I saw another one that this guy said, who's more generous, men or women? And he had a little cup for men, a little cup for women. He was trying to generate some funds that way. Well, there's a lady here that said, just grabbed my heart. She said, I have no excuse. I just need some help. Thank you, and God bless. They always appeal to God, to our faith, because they know that, th that the, the mandate of the Christian walk is to give to love and to care. I, um, I think this is a heart rendering. Please help homeless with two kids. Some are genuinely, genuinely, sincerely needy. And so at, at, at the end of their rope, they have no idea where to go. And this seemed to be the solution. Um, I read of a, of a sign where this shriveled up old guy that said, we'll strip for a dollar. <laughs> and there was another one that said, I'm not homeless, I just need a beer. <laughs> it's uh, really in incredible, isn't it? And yet, you see the, you see the tension that we all, um, uh, we all experience when you see a panhandler on the side of the road. What do you do? I read of an account, she, uh, a lady said that uh, she did not give money, but she looked him in the eye, rolled down her window and said, are you okay? Are you okay? And I do pray that God will bless you and meet your needs and help you find shelter. And John 3.16 is not far. Another guy said, I just bought your dinner at John 3.16. My church has a soup kitchen. I just contributed there to try to get these people mainstreamed into a place where they can be helped. One thing we need to know is that God can turn our heart of stone into a heart of flesh and release our funds for his use, release our funds for his use. One sign that uh, made sense to me was a mom standing out on the corner and she said, please don't give heroin money to my kids. You see, we've got to get help and uh, a dollar or two is, um, can be invested in uh, good, wholesome help. Now, we want to be careful that um, we uh, serve as a voice of encouragement. And there's a little verse in Hebrews 3.13 that I, I love. And it says, encourage one another daily, as long as it is called today, so that none of us are hardened by sin's deceitfulness. That's when we hold out our fist and say, no, I'm going to keep my money. <laughs> they could go get a job they're hiring all over town. <clears throat> but we have more than money. We have love, 
the love of the Lord Jesus Christ, and only he can give those life-saving hope, that grace and mercy that we need. And it is our job to love one person at a time. Now, the, the idea that faith has mercy feet, we have mercy feet, not just feet of faith, but we have mercy feet. And the, the idea that we don't know what the needs are and why they are on the street with a sign. I have uh, seven reasons, seven insights that might be interesting to you. These are just seven of many. One is a woman might be on the street and, and excuse me, gentlemen, but on her period and there are limited products. Feminine products range from, from a uh, price from five to $10 per box and they are not covered in government sub subsidy programs. Women are using socks, plastic bags, paper napkins, and rags, which leads to infection. A second thing is that pregnancy complicates everything. And uh, we heard an illustration of that from Scott Rainey, didn't we? How devastating a pregnancy can be. And uh, it, we had a little 16-year-old girl who uh, was pregnant, and she ran away from home, and she went out on the streets because she was afraid child um, uh, protective services would take her baby. She was even afraid that a shelter would turn her in and, and she would, uh, they would remove her baby. So she put herself and her baby at risk by living on the, on the streets. And I'll tell you that school was the last thing on her mind. Did you know that more than half of all homeless mothers have no high school diploma? Serious. Okay, then there are babies. Babies have needs and moms need help. And we have a two-year-old and a four-year-old and, and teenage grandkids and we understand how help, <laughs> how, how much help moms need. Did you know that diapers and wipes are not covered by government assistance? That cloth diapers can be hand washed, but have you checked the, the price of Tide? Have you looked into detergent lately and how expensive it is? and uh, laundromats, so they're, they're really at a disadvantage there. The, th the fourth reason is that there are barriers to employment, and honestly, I am guilty over and over of saying, there is a s uh, hiring signs all over our community. Why are they on the streets? Why aren't they seeking out a job? But look at this, why? What do you do with your kids? And uh, most places would want you to, to, to work you know, strange hours or ir irregular hours. What about low education levels? You don't have a high school diploma. How, what do you do? What about a criminal record? We had a, a little gal on house arrest at uh, one of our uh, retreats and she had to check in, check in, check in, always assured that she was present when she needed to be. What about physical and emotional uh, disabilities and mental disabilities and English as a second language? There, there is also uh, uh, housing instability, and that's no secret when you start paying rent and utilities and uh, everything to maintain a household and lose a job or have a, a, a difficult uh, time, you know that you are um, looking for help, looking for help. Then there's a lack of transportation. Next door to the, um, or not far from the ho homeless shelter in Indiana, there was a, a car repair shop and it said, this big sign said, car running badly, call Bradley. Well, Carl, uh, call Bradley, Bradley was, uh, he was taking advantage of people and those homeless women just thought Bradley would help them out and if he said their car was a <coughs> piece of junk, he'd take care of it. They'd give it to them and he'd take care of it all right. <laughs> so a, a lack of transportation and a lack of a wise voice or a, a insight into is this car <coughs> Be serviceable, and, and if so, how much, right? Okay, then six is illness, and we know that addictions are rampant. People are have struggle with high anxiety. You have aging women on the streets. You have depression, bipolar. Anybody know someone who is bipolar without drugs? There's schizophrenia self-harm, cutting is a huge problem. There are those who attempt suicide and then post-traumatic stress disorder. They all threaten the mental and physical well-being. 
to pray that um, we would understand. Uh, at one point in um, Indiana, there was a lady named Judy whose niece had tied her to a tree and first thing in the morning, all day long, and, and, and at night, they would bring her in. This family was taking her uh, social security check and uh, she was about this big around. And honestly, she would have died if the neighbor's dog had not just been so loud and irritating that another neighbor called the police. And in their investigation of that property, they looked over the weeds and the fence <coughs> to discover Judy tied to a tree. And honestly, Judy was uh, completely and totally disabled in so many ways by that tr post-traumatic syndrome. And you think about uh, a lady, one lady in our group could not pour water from a pitcher to a cup. I was teaching on the living water and I thought that would be a good exercise for us to go around the table and give each other a cup of cold water. She, she hesitated again and again. She wasn't sure. She looked at me, what, what do I do? What do I do? Just pour water. That's all, pour water. So post-traumatic syndrome disorder is huge in these women. And then there's uh, also the lack of ho housing, which uh, a lot of landlords don't want a single mom with kids. That means trouble because the man there's a man somewhere or a problem of some kind looming. And then the last of the seven is domestic violence. One in every four women has experienced dom domestic violence in their lifetime. <coughs> and on the average, a woman will return to her abuser seven times seven times. We experienced this with our Cassie. She just kept going back to the guy. Three years just go, kept going back to him. Why? She believes she's somehow to blame. Her children will keep her from um, leaving. The feelings of abandoning family unit. Religious beliefs. Love. Promises of change. The lack of options. Fear. Her belief that hmm, things will be different this time. He has promised. There are feelings of guilt. There's a lack of support, threats, economic reality, the lack of resources, and feelings of powerlessness. She can't possibly get a job, not even at McDonald's, if she has experienced this trauma. Now, um, I think that uh, there are some, too, that are in poverty by choice. There's material poverty, and there's generational poverty where this is what they learn, this is what their grandpa did, their dad did, their, you know, they just continue that. And then there's situational poverty where your house is on fire and you burn, you lose everything in a fire. Then what? Then what? And all of your resources are depleted. Then what? Then what? You might find help at the church, like the lady with issues of blood who went to, 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 see those who had testified that Jesus, Jesus saves and heals and delivers. Okay, all together, let's read this. The God of peace shall soon crush Satan under your feet. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Romans 16, 20. Okay, so what can the church do if you're overwhelmed by all the needs? There are definitely ways that we can help, and we're going to shift into our uh, worksheet now and that uh, know that every morning when you put on your shoes ask God to give you mercy mercy feet mercy feet feet of faith and feet of action and feet of creativity and passion and compassion God can do this he is the God of all flesh there isn't anything too difficult for us to do when he asks us right okay so let's look at um Let's look at this. Faith has feet. And what I'd like for you to do is look at your shoe and what color your shoe is. And uh, sh uh, hold up your, okay, all right. Okay, we all, there are, I think, four different colors. So I'd like for you to stand up and find uh, your group. Blue, blue over here in this corner, how's that? How about lime green over here in this corner? Yellow, you want to come up here? And... Uh, Red, orange, how about right here? We'll combine red and orange right here. <laughs> oh, that's good. Green, that's good. That's good. 
Yeah, yeah right here. All right. Okay, all of a sudden, is it warm in here to you? Are you okay? It's not warm? Okay, what I'd like for you to do is take your sheet and uh, the, first, uh, the first steps here are, uh, of course, we know anytime we're going to launch into a new ministry, what color are you back there? Blue. Oh, blue. Okay, blue in that corner. Yes, blue. Okay. <laughs> okay, so that's good. All right, so <coughs> look at your sheet, and, and you, we all know that anytime we launch into a new ministry, that we, we must pray and fast and seek God's kingdom, his vision, and then, and then engage the church. Be sure you go to the pastor. <laughs> when you have this wonderful idea, be sure you go to the pastor and share your vision. Then build your committee. Then uh, proceed forward with the blessings of the church. No man is an island, and we can't do this without the, the structure of the church. Okay, and then partner with local charities that are already established ministries. Visit your homeless community, your shelters, uh, the Salvation Army, and other um, established ministries, and then ask for opportunities to pray with uh, uh, individuals. So what I'd like for you to do is look at the list of supplies that are not covered by the government welfare programs. That's your first, that's your first thing. And the second is to uh, address the 10 ways that you could utilize your church building to meet needs. <coughs> okay, so if you'd like to pull your chairs around, I think that would be okay. And we're giving our videography <laughs> a little challenge here. But if you want to pull your chairs around, we'll, we'll just take a few minutes here, and then we'll come back and share ideas. How's that? Okay, so you, you want to be scattered through for just 10 yeah. oh, here, here. Okay, so on your sheet, you have um, 10 ways to utilize your church building, 10, year, 10 ways you can utilize your church building. So you don't have to go, you can, you can open your doors and meet needs. Um, just read over those things. There are just a, a few ideas, 10 ideas that you can uh, utilize your church facility to help uh, meet the needs of your community. And there are incredible ways that COVID, COVID opened some doors for us to be a lot more intentional, didn't it? In fact, look at number five. Look at number five. A lot of times people in need don't know even where to turn to get help. You have, uh, in your community, you, you have um, a thrift shop or a food kitchen or a food pantry within your community, familiarize yourself with the community so you know what's available to help others. Okay, so share how your, how your church facility might meet some of these needs, or if you're already meeting needs, explain that. So we'll just take about six minutes to do it. Okay, I'd like to introduce you to Heather Bryant. She is a family friend and wonderful, wonderful partner in the gospel. And she uh, would like to just share for a minute some of her experiences. Hi, right friends. Here, right here. Uh, sure, yeah. absolutely. Uh, my name's Heather Bryant. I uh, grew up in this church and uh, love Northeast Oklahoma District. Uh, I currently serve at Mental Health Association Oklahoma which they're a statewide nonprofit in Oklahoma that serves at the intersection of homelessness and mental illness. And we serve about 30,000, uh, probably of the most vulnerable Oklahomans that you, you know, could imagine uh, to really have a chance to go from uh, seeing people experiencing homelessness on the street to providing them wraparound services to housing to also helping kids who might need some mental help right in schools 
And so all that to say, I think the church is part of the answer of how we help people 100%. I also think we can be smart in how we help partner with other nonprofits and governmental agencies, and Oklahoma's brilliant. And so a couple of things that I wanted to just briefly share with you are some really immediate helps that sometimes church people don't know. Um, one would be Hunger Free Oklahoma uh, has a statewide organization that you can lead people to call in to help people apply for SNAP or WIC, i.e. food stamps, and they'll help them figure it out and make it easier for people to get uh, food stamps easily. The USDA, this is the best kept secret ever, says we believe that, that we should feed children. And so much so that any organization that has a kitchen, i.e. a church, maybe has uh, training that helps uh, be kids safe, right? Um, can basically get reimbursed for every single meal that you offer for a kids after school program i.e. the government will pay wow. you to do a children's wow. ministry, right? And, and if, if, if you do that, parents start showing up to pick up their kids on occasion, and then you just created a whole different strategy for how you keep your rural church or, or urban church open. Just an interesting yeah. thought, right? Uh, but the third thing is in Tulsa and in Oklahoma City, if you actually see somebody on the streets and you're like, I really wish I could help them, if you go to Mental Health Association Oklahoma, MHAOK.org, and you Google get help, there's actually a place where you can go, I saw this person on this side street, this intersection, and can you and your street outreach team go and check on them and help them, and we have a mobile medical team, and then we can get them signed up for services and a whole continuum of care to help people really get wow. the help they need, right? And uh, beyond that, we all know that uh, mental health is a big deal right now. People, you know, suicide ideation is increasing. And so if you ever want to go through a training called QPR, Question, uh, Persuade, Refer, it's, it's kind of a suicide prevention training, and Mental Health Association does that too, and you can sign up at that uh, website. All that to say, with, with, with all of that, Cheryl's not wrong. Uh, every place in the United States seems to have a housing problem, and in the city of Tulsa right now, uh, according to the Tulsa Housing Authority, there's at least uh, a group of about 4,000 housing units that we don't have. So when you see somebody experiencing homelessness, it might be because of all of those seven things we've talked about, but it might actually be because there's not enough housing in Tulsa. And beyond that, we've been able to get people housing vouchers but not every landlord will accept those housing vouchers. So people are trying to get help, and then they still can't find housing. And so in many ways, when I see somebody on the street, sometimes I go, you know, what did they do to deserve that? But in many ways, I would say Oklahomans, as you know, are incredibly resilient, and sometimes trying to figure out ways to help themselves, but also there's a huge amount of nonprofits ready to help them as well, and we can be smarter to partner with them. Yeah. And mm -hmm. so just wanted to show, share with you a couple of things. Hunger Free Oklahoma and how to point to them. And they'll actually help you with this USA, USDA <coughs> idea of helping you figure out how to maybe get that uh, food children's ministry going inside your church. They'd love to help you. Um, and then again, Mental Health Association Get Help is the place where you can just fill out a form and say, I saw this person on this corner and I think they might need assistance. Here's one way to do it. But I do wow. love John 3.16 and Salvation Army and other shelters inside the area. They're also doing great work. Tulsa Day Center as well. Thank you. Amen. Thank you, Heather. Yep. Thank you. This was of the Lord, uh, ordained moment. Yes, thank the Lord. Now, do you have a question for her? Okay, you Sorry. do. Yeah. Wait, just come to the microphone, yeah. Heather. Yeah. Okay, listen carefully and jot it down, okay? Yeah, so if you just Google it, you'll be able to find it immediately. Hunger Free Oklahoma is the place to help people get signed up for food stamps and things like that that will immediately make it 10 times faster for them to get approved. Uh, and then Mental Health Association Oklahoma is mhaok.org. And if you Google Get Help, you'll be able to get immediately to that, uh, that 
uh, contact form to, to fill that out. And there's our street outreach teams will go and, and assist uh, people who, who might need help. Wow, well, and thank you so much. And the USDA one? Uh, yes, so, so that's common knowledge, but if you go to Hunger Free Oklahoma, uh, there's a group, a, a state outreach group that will uh, not only teach you all about it, but Treasure Standiford and all to connect you. But if you go there and, and ask the question, they'll be able to not only get you all the information you need, but we'll actually walk you through it and train you or train your church on how to fill out the right paperwork and get it started, which the is, is, is the way to start that. Yep. <coughs> is the church affiliate a school board school? Mm -hmm. Would you like to go speak at a Baptist or Hebrew Baptist or something like that? Uh, it, kind of depends uh, it won't be super it's, it's not as super uh, uh, complex as you might think but at the same time there's a secondary way so you can get reimbursed or you could also partner with one of the two uh, local community food banks so community food bank of, of eastern oklahoma is also another way to make this super easy as well but if you want a cheap and easy way to have a children's ministry that feeds people, and if every church in Northeast Oklahoma district did that, Nazarenes were known for feeding kids on the government's dime, that's a little funny and great, right? I mean, just interesting thought. But interesting thought. It's, uh, it's, it's something fun to maybe think about how, we, how do we want to help people and not have to pay for it. Well, so. thank you again. Thank you again. You can talk with Heather after our session. We're just about to, to the end here, but I'd like to hear from others. Do you have anybody else have a really great a story to, to share or a, an experience that you are a ministry? Okay, yeah, from your small group. I want to hear, hear from you. So I'm with the uh, New Life Nazarene Church in Miami. And Come up to the We've had a homeless ministry for about three years. We had a couple join our church that had the address or non-address of about 35 homeless people in our community. What bridge they were under, what abandoned shed they were in, what abandoned house they were in. It started out as a food ministry, taking food to those 35 locations every week. And then we decided to open our church. Uh, we have showers. We installed, um, we just used to have one old washer and dryer that we did our local laundry with. We took that out, we put stackable ones, wow. three, three stackable washers and dryers. We allow them to come in and do their laundry twice a week. We allow them to do uh, shower twice a week. We feed them twice a week. And uh, just been an amazing program. You know, all these items that's on the sheet that's feminine products and toothbrushes and deodorants and all that's just on a table they can take what they need and they don't abuse it I mean and you know realistically it's not the panhandlers that are coming it's the people living under the bridge and some of them living comfortably under the bridge so they chose to be there and like I told my group you know this one guy he <coughs> he would go down to the river every day and get the rocks to build his rock house underneath this bridge. He had a bed in there, he had a fire pit in there, and uh, he's living comfortably with no bills and nothing else, and he was happy to be there. But he needed somewhere to shower, he needed somewhere to do his laundry so he wasn't nasty. That's what we provided. Um, but um, Miami Church of the Nazarene, let's hear it for him. Wow, that's incredible. Incredible. <coughs> Anybody else have a story to tell? Okay, yeah. Go. I'm with the Freedom Fellowship Church of Nazarene in Muskogee, and we actually run a uh, clothing closet and a food bank and, uh, I mean, a food pantry, and we also do one free meal <coughs> a month, which we had last night, and we actually ran out of food, and that's kind of interesting I mean we don't usually get that very often so we uh, we've been doing it for about seven years and uh, we've been a lot of our clients are the homeless and the very poor we don't take any inf uh, income information or on it's whoever shows up we just take a name and address a phone number if they have it and uh, we we started it saying we wanted to reach the people that were falling through the cracks because you know if you're very poor you can usually get the government to help on some of the things and if you know then you have the people that are just 
just above that, that they can't get any help because they don't have the money, but the government's not going to help them. So that's the people we started off working and helping. So and as I said, we've been doing it about six, seven years, and we hope to grow more, do more with computers, and get more, in, more stuff going with the community. We're in the process of putting together hygiene bags that will have the toothpaste, you know, and we, so we're going to be handing those out. So. Wow, great. And what is your church again? Uh, Freedom Fellowship in Muskogee. Freedom Fellowship in Muskogee. Thank you. Thank you. We praise the Lord for you. Thank you. Well, anyone else? Right quick. Have it, something to share. We have been um, blessed with the Porters, <laughs> Dr. Jerry and Tony Porter, and their all their missions work and all of that. So many uh, people's needs have been met through their love and giving and yeah. self-sacrifice. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Okay. Oh, the the voice over here that has been my strong right arm said, "What about the church serving as a place to get mail?" And that is a huge problem. They can't, you know, you think about it. You can't get a government subsidy. You can't get food stamps if you don't have a place, a, a place, a, a, lo a location. Where are you? Where do we find you? So that's really a huge one. Now, um, was there anything else on this sheet you'd like to highlight as far as something you, you could utilize, a goal that you'd like to share, that you would plan to better utilize your building, or that the Lord is kind of touched on something that would encourage you. Yes, hi, hi, glad to see you. I shared uh, with my group, uh, we, we started a nonprofit organization that used some of these things, and the lady uh, kind of birthed this. We had a vision, really, just a, a real vision. Uh, at a certain location, certain ministries or whatever, and she didn't have that, she didn't have the money, and I just encouraged her, I said, let's, let's do what we can with what we got. Do what you can with what you've got. Yeah. That's great. We are concluding right now. I see there are people mulling around, so we maybe have gone over a, a minute. But thank the Lord for your tremendous investment in his kingdom, and may his name be praised and glorified as we put faith to our feet. As a combat boot, he's going he's gonna to crush Satan under our feet, guys. <laughs> Go with God, and thank you so much. Yeah.